name is Chaplain Captain Anna Page. I am the battalion chaplain for the 414th Civil Affairs Battalion out of Southfield, Michigan. And in my civilian capacity, I'm an Episcopal priest located in Raleigh, North Carolina. And with that, just a brief disclaimer, as an Episcopal priest, I will be teaching tonight primarily from a Judeo-Christian lens. However, the concepts that I'm going to suggest or propose to us tonight are not inherently Christian and might actually be more universal in nature. You yourself might be familiar with them in your own tradition or spirituality just by a different name. So if you are, please drop that in the comment box or the chat function on Facebook as we're live, because I'm learning too. And I would love to hear how others refer to the concepts about which we'll be speaking tonight. Especially because learning to listen well requires perspective taking and getting to hear how others understand the world and seeking to understand how others understand the world. Especially since listening well requires understanding that we're all interwoven in a meshwork of life. But we'll get to that in just a moment. First, let me share my screen and we'll jump right in into our slides. So as you can see here from the slide that I'm pulling up, our topic of discussion tonight is cultivating a personal ethic of listening. And before we begin, I just wanna establish a few norms for us or a few ground rules. The first is a norm of exploration. And by that, I mean that this is our space to create, dream, and imagine the world as it could be. So be curious, be curious about the material presented, be curious about yourselves, curious about others, and curious about our world. The second is a norm of participation. Please type your questions, comments, reflections into the chat function as we're live tonight or as whenever you review this video. And myself or as somebody from Chaplain Ippolito's team will be able to respond. And last is a norm of respect. Seek to understand before being understood and listen to understand rather than to prove. So what are we doing tonight with cultivating a personal ethic of listening? Well, tonight I'm going to suggest one way to listen well to another. And what I'm suggesting tonight is not a new concept. In fact, this way of listening has been advocated for and championed by civil rights activists, liberation scholars and theologians, peace builders throughout history. So what I'm proposing falls in line with a long history of other people who have championed the same principle. And what I'm proposing is that we must cultivate a personal ethic of listening by which we not only intently listen to others, but also see ourselves as interwoven with others. If we are to create a world in which all persons can flourish. So let me say that again. We must cultivate a personal ethic of listening by which we not only intently listen to others, but also see ourselves as interwoven with others if we are to create a world in which all persons can flourish. If we do not learn to listen to others well, then we will only drive misunderstanding, division, and hate. So how are we gonna explore this tonight? Well, we're gonna explore three questions. The first is what does it mean to listen well? Then what would our societies look like if we listened well, according to how we define listening well? And the last is how do we live out listening well? And that's gonna lead us into some practical implications for our personal lives, all the way up to our systems and institutions. So let's jump in with what does it mean to listen well? Well, before we even answer what it means to listen well, I'd suggest that we ask to whom or what are we listening? And to that answer, I offer four categories. Is that in life, we listen to God or our concept of the divine. We listen to others, listen to the self and listen to creation. God or the divine, others, self and creation. And I bring up these four categories to expand our minds, to imagine about to whom or what do we listen? 
because I think it's easy to fall into this mindset that we only listen to other people. But the world is constantly telling us messages, constantly speaking to us, and we constantly speaking to it. So keep these four categories in mind of to whom or what do we listen. So now, what does it mean to listen well? Well, I recognize that listening well to each of these categories, God or the divine, others, self, and creation, might all take its own tack. But there are some general principles of active listening that I'd like to bring to our attention tonight. And we've likely all heard these before. Principles like creating eye contact with the object or person to whom you're listening, nonverbal affirmations, a nodding of the head, a leaning in closer, a leaning backwards, verbal affirmations of, hmm, yes, interesting, and patience, being able to sit and wait as the other explains what is on their mind or heart. So if you're tuning in now, you've probably already heard these principles before, and you very likely already employ them in your own life, which is awesome. Please keep doing that because the world needs active listeners. What I'm gonna add to this mix though, is that to actively listen and to listen well, we need to envision ourselves as enmeshed with the person to whom we're speaking. Envisioning ourselves as enmeshed with the person to whom we're speaking. And by this, I mean devoting your full time, attention, and being to the person with whom you're speaking in such a way that it feels like your future depends on hearing their words. If they're expressing pain, you feel that pain. If they're expressing joy, you celebrate that joy. Another way of thinking about this could be invoking empathy when we actively listen, feeling with the person to whom we're listening. But I'm gonna ask us to stick with this idea of enmeshed because it's going to keep coming up throughout the rest of our discussion tonight. So these principles of active listening, eye contact, affirmations, verbal and nonverbal, patience and understanding ourselves as fully enmeshed are principles that I'd like for us to take forward as we think about cultivating our own ethics of listening. Because ultimately cultivating a personal ethic of listening, which leads us to listen with intentionality and seeing ourselves as interwoven or enmeshed, establishes the foundation of creating understanding, connection, and love. So you might be wondering, what would our societies look like if we listened well, if we listened with intentionality to our understanding of the divine, others, ourselves, and creation? Well, ultimately, I believe that our societies would reflect the ecology that we already see in nature. So with that, I'm gonna to suggest to us three models for what listening well, according to how we just define listening well, could look like. They'll show us a sense of interconnectedness. So with that, our first model. And this first model that I wanna to propose to us is suggested by anthropologist Tim Ingold. So Ingold has this theory called the meshwork theory, as you see here on the screen, and it's about human connectivity. Ingold literally writes about lines, like the lines about which you would have learned in eighth or ninth grade when you took geometry for the first time, meaning the distance between two points, which is what you see here on the network side of the screen. You'll see points A and B, for example, designating a set distance. But what Ingold argues is that life actually isn't lived linearly. Instead, life is lived through wayfaring or journeying, not from point to point through, not from point to point, but through, around, to and from, from and to places everywhere, which is what we see in the meshwork side of the slide. 
Ingold says, as humans traverse, our trails become intertwined and create knots, as you can see with those kind of jumbled sections under meshwork. And these knots are places of connection. They're intertwined and create an entangled and enmeshed web. The state of enmeshment then forces us to understand ourselves as in relationship with others because we are so deeply intertwined. Our connections then create fungi-like meshworks, which replace the network model. And this meshwork, no one exists in it without one another. So in summary, what Ingold is doing here is saying, we've believed for so long that we live in this network where we're connected from point A to B, B to C, C to D. But he's replacing the network with a meshwork, saying that because humans travel to and from and around and between, we create a fungi-like meshwork with points or nodes of connectivity because we are all intertwined like an ecological system. And to get to this theory, Ingold looked both yes to ecology and to nature, and also to the wisdom of ancestors, which brings us to our second model of connectivity, a model by the name of Ubuntu. And Ubuntu is a word or a, a philosophy really, which comes from the Nguni language spoken throughout Southern Africa. Often the word Ubuntu is associated with Nelson Mandela and Archbishop Desmond Tutu, especially during the Truth and Reconciliation Commission in post-apartheid South Africa. And there's no one clear definition for Ubuntu in English because it is a Nguni word that doesn't have a direct translation when we try to take this philosophical concept or way of being and put a nice, neat definition to it. I will offer us a few definitions though. And ways that Ubuntu can be defined are that Ubuntu is about connectedness, which exists between all living creatures especially people. And this sense of connectedness of all living creatures, especially people, is more of a humanist philosophy. Another way of defining Ubuntu is behaving well towards others or acting in ways that benefit the community. And a third definition is a soul force, an actual metaphysical connection shared between people and creation, which helps connect us with one another. So the soul force or this life force that connects all of us together. And Ubuntu can't be seen, but a philosophy that can be embodied. It's this belief, this all encompassing belief and way of being that we are interconnected, that my actions impact you and yours impact me. And as you can see on the screen here, there are a few different takes on Ubuntu. So as I mentioned earlier, it's most often associated with Archbishop Tutu and Nelson Mandela. And here Tutu says that in the spirit of Ubuntu, he understands that my humanity is caught up, is inextricably bound up in what is yours. Then we see this philosophy continuing, especially into the civil rights era in the United States, where we get activists like Fannie Lou Hammer who say nobody's free until everybody is free. Our collective liberation must be achieved. Another way of understanding Ubuntu is I can't be fully me unless you can be fully you. So we need to create the conditions that allow for all of us to live into our fullest senses of self. And we see this often in restorative justice practices where we bring someone back into society, make amends and yes, even reparations as need be. And the last understanding or uh, way of enacting Ubuntu is through this Nguni proverb of a person is a person through other persons. I get defined based on my relationship, my interconnectedness to everybody else in this world. Like we just said with Ingold, no one exists without one another. Which brings us to our last model. And this final model that I'd like to propose for how we think of ourselves as enmeshed comes from Christianity and in particular, comes from the work of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and Coretta Scott King. And this model is known as the beloved community. So the Kings write about the beloved community and the Episcopal church, which is my faith tradition, has adapted their definition for the work that we are doing, especially in the realm of racial justice. 
And the definition that the Episcopal Church has come, off, come up with based off of the King's definition is that the beloved community is the body within which all people can grow to love God and love the image of God that we find in our neighbors, in ourselves, and in creation. This definition reminds us that we always listen to God, or our concept of the divine, listen to others, listen to ourself, and listen to creation. Essentially, beloved community is about how we relate to people and creation of all identifiers from different races, ethnicities, national orientations, national origins, sexual orientations, religions, socioeconomic classes, gender identity, the environment, and yes, to my fellow Christians who might be listening, even Christians of different denominations. And ultimately, we find ourselves in the beloved community when we understand ourselves as enmeshed in Ubuntu-like relationships with the rest of the world. Now, you might have just heard all of that and be saying, Chaplain Page, that sounds real ideal, but none of that's practical. Humans are humans and we're inherently self-interested and maybe even fallen. Well, with that, let me give a little bit of voice to, yes, the potential dangers of these philosophies because they really only work when we all ascribe to them, all understand ourselves as fully in community with the rest of the created world. Because our human tendencies creep in. Oftentimes we'll find ourselves breaking our connectedness and instead turning to in-groups and out-groups, which I've demonstrated here with this new slide showing the breaks in the model. We see this X over in mesh work when our human tendency creeps in and we create in-group, out-group, and instead we revert back to the network model. But not only do we revert back to the network model, we revert back and break the only links that we had established. And instead, we see ourselves as individuals in this world, just occupying vacuous spaces, rather than the interconnected beings inhabiting place together, which is what we suggested in Meshwork. And from this occupation mentality, this is where we experience war, division, suffering, isolation, racism, sexism, extremism, all of the isms, marginalization and injustice at personal and systemic levels. So what this means though, is that for these models to work, we collectively need to center economic and social justice from both the interpersonal to the institutional level and make these realities before any of these models can become our collective societal reality. Because if we don't first center justice in a fully embodied way, power will default to existing powers and principalities. And I recognize that's a big claim with a lot of implications. And in just a few minutes here, we're gonna get into some of the implications of enacting these theories. Because right now you might be saying, wow, these are idyllic, this sounds so nice hold on to these theories, maintain presence of recognizing that we listen to God, others, ourselves, and creation. And let's strive to make these a reality. So I'm gonna give us a few practical tips of what it looks like to put these theories into practice. And that leads us into our question of, how do we live out this idea of listening well? of listening in a fully embodied state that envisions us all as enmeshed. Well, when our ethic of listening implores us to see the world as interwoven, then we are called to live love and enact peace since our collective well-being is tied together. And one way of understanding living love and enacting peace are through the biblical concepts of agape and shalom. And these are biblical terms which speak to interpersonal relationships with humanity and creation. Shalom comes from the Hebrew Bible and we're first introduced to it in the Hebrew Bible. And agape is a Greek term frequently used in the New Testament by Jesus's disciples. 
Both terms show us how to live in striving to make Ubuntu, meshwork, and the beloved community a reality. So let's start with agape. Agape, as you see here, is this all-encompassing, total self-giving love. It's unconditional, and it's not just something that happens passively to people, but it is an action. Agape is a choice that we make to seek the well-being of others above ourselves. It's a choice. It's about treating well the person who maybe we can't stand, but treating them as if they have the spark of the divine within them too. Actively understanding us all as interconnected. Then we get to this concept of shalom. And again, as you see here, shalom connotes the absence of war, strife, enmity, quarrel, and suggests peace among all people of a communal life. And the goal of shalom, again, this is an actionable word, just like agape, the goal of shalom is replacing quarrel, strife, and war with wholeness or completeness, a state of well-being, tranquility, prosperity, security. It's a manifestation of divine grace. So I, I think and I believe that we can make a meshwork a reality when we live into peace or restoration with others and with ourselves, and we show love to others, especially those who may be overlooked in society. And I wanna note here the emphasis on restoration or justice for this peace to occur, which just underscores the action that is required to make shalom a reality and to enact agape. Because also important to note is that while these terms, yes, enable introspection, they're namely played out and defined in community. They push us to understand ourselves as in relationship with others, which all comes back to underscoring the importance of cultivating a personal ethic of listening. So we've so far talked, what does it mean to listen well? What would our world or our society look like if we listened well? And how do we enact listening well? I'm gonna move us on to some practical implications. The image that you see here on the screen of the um, concentric circles here with the dotted lines in between show us that there is no me without you. The personal me, the I, rests within interpersonal relationships that inform me and that I inform, which rest within communities that are informed by relationships and that relationships inform. And those communities rest within systems or institutions, which again, shape communities, relationships and people, just like people, relationships and communities shape systems. This is not a linear process. And the implications of this meshwork theory and understanding ourselves in relationship with the entire world of listening in a fully embodied sense are huge. Because on a personal level, cultivating a personal ethic of listening requires us thinking critically and ethically about how I live impacts others. It requires us working on our empathy, especially by striving to understand the lived experiences of those who may be perceived as different than ourselves. And this can be done through reading, writing, reflecting, conversation, Personal implications continue to include always asking ourselves, who am I including? Who am I excluding? Who is not at the table? Requires us being mindful of the environment and our personal environmental impacts. To consider who, to whom, to what, to where do I give my money, my time, my gifts? And then considering how my money, my time, my gifts, my talents and position can be used in justice and healing, ministries of reconciliation, community building and peace building. Personal implications require us listening more and talking less, which I understand the irony of me giving a one-way lecture is great, but on average, listen more, talk less. We're required to ask, how can I use my position to make a difference in the world? 
Personal implications also include checking our own assumptions, stereotypes, and biases, which we all hold, just means we need to check them. And also always monitoring our language to make sure that we're not using outdated language or language that comes from a long line of racism, sexism, homophobia, or xenophobia to ensure that we are reflecting the respect and honor that we have for all people and all of creation and the words that we choose to use. Moving on to that second rung of interpersonal implications. These sound like making a new friend, smiling at a stranger, inviting someone into a conversation, and also correcting someone when they use derogatory language, holding each other accountable to help create a world in which all people feel safe and affirmed. To the next rung out into the communal implications, this might sound like participating in intentional community with others, getting to know your neighbors, creating norms which affirm, welcome, and include all persons, which means denouncing racism, sexism, homophobia, and Christian nationalism. It, communal norms also mean checking in on our community members when violence and hate occur and ensuring that no one is isolated. And then we move to this outer rung, the systemic implications. And the implications at the systemic level look like understanding the role of systems and institutions in perpetuating injustice, then learning where we as individuals at that personal level fit into this. Systemic implications look like dismantling of American individualism so that we know and fully believe that we're enmeshed. Systemic implications also require us asking not just who is at the table, but who is keeping or what is keeping someone or a group of someone's from having a seat at the table and then removing those barriers to equity and inclusion. And finally, systemic implications also include ending white supremacy and extremism. So these are big implications that come from this idea that we must cultivate an ethic of listening that looks like not just taking the time to listen with intentionality, but also to understand ourselves as interwoven with the rest of the created world, of understanding that the personal rests within interpersonal, communal, and systemic. And what I suggested tonight about understanding ourselves as enmeshed in the world is not a new concept. Womanists, liberation scholars, peacemakers, and civil rights activists have been teaching this principle, this philosophy, this way of being throughout history. And though it is an old concept, it is so timely for today, given the divisiveness, hate, and injustice of our current world. So as I suggest here up on the screen, as we cultivate this personal ethic of listening, which helps us understand ourselves as enmeshed in communities of Ubuntu and beloved community, enacting shalom and agape, and all of these philosophies and principles working together in a continued cyclical way, we can replace that division, hate, injustice, and polarization with understanding, love, and unity. My email is up here on the screen. If you have any questions, please feel free to drop them in the Facebook Live chat or send them over to me to my email. And if you're curious about other resources, to consult or to read, take a look at these lists of names and books. These have all informed the work here that you've seen, to, seen tonight and continue to inform how I view the world. Walk in love, do justice, and be there for others. Thank you again for your time tonight.